Underwriting for the production of Auto Lime this week has been provided by. Auto Line is brought to you in part by the commercial vehicle brands of Tenneco, pioneering global ideas for cleaner air and quieter, smoother, and safer transportation. Ford Warner, developing advanced technologies specifically aimed at reducing emissions, increasing fuel economy, and improving performance. Our award-winning innovations extend from turbocharging and cooling systems to friction materials and diesel cold start technology. Built on a century-long reputation of innovation and reliability, we have the track record that proves our technology can help meet the challenges of the commercial truck and off-highway industry. Deloitte's Automotive Group is at the forefront, driving transformation and tackling complex challenges. Whether you are interested in globalizing operations, optimizing supply chains, mitigating enterprise risk, or driving innovation, Deloitte can help develop solutions that create long-lasting value. To learn more about Deloitte's Automotive Group, visit us online at deloitte.com backslash US backslash automotive. From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on Auto Line this week, where we're going to be talking about competitive intelligence. How do car companies and suppliers keep track of what the competition is up to and all about? I've got three experts to talk about that today, including Adam Bernard with General Motors. He's the Associate Director of Competitive Intelligence. Michael Amatoso is the Senior Manager of Global Market Intelligence for the Eaton Corporation. And Joe McCabe is the President and CEO of Auto Forecast Solutions. I want to thank the three of you for joining Thanks, me Adam. here Good today. To be here. Adam, I'm going to start with you right. because I see you at a lot of auto shows. And I love talking to you on the trip over to those shows because oftentimes it's out of this country even. And I want to talk to you because you already know what everyone's going to introduce at the show. I'm going there to see what they're going to introduce. So my first question is, how do you guys go out and track what the competition is up to? I think the thing for us, it's, it's multiple sources. You know, I, I you often have to tell people that, you know, we're not spies. We don't dumpster die. We don't plant listening devices. But there's a lot of legitimate sources of information out there. You know, you read different stories in the media. You know, we do have some familiarity with future product timing. So if we know a vehicle is expected out in October, November, then a Frankfurt Auto Show launch in September is most likely. Um, nowadays, I think more automakers are starting to telegraph stuff ahead of time. Um, Infinity just announced the Q30 is going to be at Frankfurt today. So that gets added to the list. Um, and just informal stuff, you know, we all have our informal network. So I chat with other journalists. Sometimes you might find out that someone's been invited to an event. Uh, we heard that a lot in New York before the New York Auto Show about the Lincoln Continental and talked to people invited to a Lincoln event and, all right, MKS is probably next up and we've heard Continental tossed around. So you start to put two and two together and, and put all the pieces into place. Michael, you're with a supplier company. Uh, do you keep track as much as the suppliers as the OEMs? And same question that I posed to Adam there. How do you go about getting all this information? Yes, we have various sources of information. We buy uh, data from forecasting companies such as IHS and LMC Automotive. We also have our sales team, our account managers, contact the uh, OEMs, their clients directly, and ask about future programs, current programs, projected uh, sales and production figures worldwide. And we have an extensive team of analysts in North America, Brazil, Europe, and Asia as well. Uh, and we look at the uh, automotive publications on a daily basis uh, and kind of triangulate. So we have information from various sources that we have to put together our best estimate of what's going to happen over the next five to ten years. Joe, I want to ask you the same thing, but I'm going to preface it by saying that you guys, I think, broke the story of where Ford is going to build the GT sports car. Mm -hmm. I was going through one of your reports, and it was like, what's this company in Canada called Multimatic? <laughs> I've never heard of them before. Right. And you guys were already saying that that was what was going to build, that company was going to build the Ford GT well before the Ford Motor Company ever announced that was going to be it. How do you come up with this stuff? Well, you know, uh, to leverage what uh, Mike's saying is uh, we have a lot of resources, uh, both public, some private. We've partnered with Ward's Auto recently as a strategic partner. We're actually their global arm for vehicle and powertrain forecasting. But we 
what we've done over the last couple decades is the relationships we built in the market, we like to corroborate our information with suppliers, with people actually bidding on it. You know, and we, we don't want to just come out with the rumor. We like to say, look, we're hearing this story, but we're going to call our contacts that we believe are the closest to understanding that because you have to have that lead time. You have to know things three years in advance, even sometimes to get a part on that. And we'll get some corroboration, and, and frankly, sometimes we get some, you know, for lack of a better term, carnal knowledge on the industry that we like to, uh, to put out to our supply base, our government, our government uh, customers, as well as our OEMs and our customers as well. Mm -hmm. So, Adam, you go out, you're collecting all this information, you're checking it all. What do you do with the information then? Uh, well, for the auto shows, we actually put together a briefing package, so, and that'll go out internally, so when our people go to the show, you know, if they've only got a half hour to spend, we'll kind of hit, here's the top ten things that we think are going to be at the show. For, when you say your people, you mean other internally, top yeah. GM executives, yeah. so they can go to the show and see the best of the best. Exactly, exactly, and we'll make ourselves available, too, if folks want to walk the show, so we'll, usually the first day we'll have a chance to hit the press conferences, take notes, collect info, so second day, sometimes we'll take folks to the show and, you know, hit all the high points and say, Here's what we saw. Here's what we expected. Usually there might be a surprise or two, although these days in the age of the Internet, it's harder and harder to keep secrets. So it's always nice, you know, when an automaker is able to surprise us at a show, as long as it's not too many surprises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I love being surprised at auto shows, but it's your job to know ahead of time. So, Michael, same question. What do you do with the information that you collect? We also uh, attend auto shows and put together a, uh, a packet for, th for the show. Uh, and we attend the supplier exhibits as well. So there's the SA in Detroit, Auto Mechanica in Germany. And um, we have certain products that we sell, uh, both in the light vehicle space as well as heavy commercial space. And we try to figure out where our products will fit into the, uh, in the auto industry, depending on what different uh, OEMs are doing. And I got to believe that Eaton Corporation is looking for trends and the like to see whether the products it's making have a safe future or whether there's a new technology that you've got to get into. Yes, we're definitely looking at trends. So in the heavy commercial market, for example, Class A trucks, uh, we have traditionally been producing uh, manual transmissions, uh, anything from 9 speeds to 18 speeds. But we see the market moving towards uh, automatics and automated manuals. So we've um, invested heavily in automated manual transmissions to follow the, uh, the market and, and be attractive to, to our customers going forward. And this all came out of your competitive uh, intelligence assessment. Then. It did, yes. And Joe, I know what you do. You, you sell your information, that's right? Yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's what you're all about. That's so yeah. who all buys your information? You know, I'd say our clients are primarily automotive suppliers. Um, and it's funny, as you walk down the tier level, the lower the tier you go, the more, for lack of a better term, is they're in the dark. Uh, you know, we get a lot of tier twos and tier threes going. We are, we have to wait till the tier ones tell us what to do. We have no idea unless something comes across our board on this. And, and it sort of gets, uh, you know, the darkness fact factor gets, uh, it gets tighter and tighter as you go down this funnel. Uh, so that's primarily our customer base. We do have some OEMs as our customers of the vehicle manufacturers. Uh, and we also have some financial houses and government agencies. So governments want to know, you know, we want to have our footprint in this automotive space. What do we need to know? A lot of times they're focused on their backyard and not on the global story. So we bring that global story and say, look, this is today, this is five years, you got to be ready for this. You don't all of a sudden have a plant come out of nowhere. If you want to survive, I mean, we talk about NAFTA a lot, the whole Canada, Mexico thing, you sort of need to know what your global footprint is and how you play in it. When you say government agencies, what kind of government agencies? Uh, uh, economic development teams, uh, the teams that are involved with the, actually we've worked with uh, local communities, mayors, things like that, that have an automotive footprint that say, we just don't know what the impact is. If we lose this business, what is the ripple effect? Or if we can gain this business, what is there is, should we be in, in this space at all? And uh, you'd be surprised how people that that is a core to their economy, uh, yet they really do need that third party outlook, unbiased outlook to come and say, well, this is how we see the pro and cons and you need to weigh them in terms of how you need to bring your business forward. And Adam, do you buy reports? I mean, I, I got to imagine that you want to just double check and oh, yeah. see what others are saying too. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of different reports that we subscribe to. Some are 
uh, what I would call broad but shallow that are more globally oriented and then there's some that are a little more regional oriented that might have some deeper product detail. And then, you know, we have folks in technology planning who will buy technology specific databases and information as well. So, and we kind of, you know, we have an internal network of folks in powertrain, manufacturing, global connected consumers. So we're always in constant touch with each other and sharing information about what we hear, you know, because, you know, you may overhear something from the powertrain guys that all of a sudden the manufacturing people need to know. So. Share the wealth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Michael, you, you said you, you do buy reports. Is, is part of it to get different reports from different companies that have expertise, or is some of it just to make sure you're cross-checking their facts? It's a little bit of both. Uh, so we, we get information from uh, our customers, who are the car, car makers. We also get information from external uh, third-party providers, kind of as a, as a sanity check. And uh, we get more than, more than one forecast, so we can look at how close they are. If they're very close, we can, we can have confidence in the forecast. If they're far apart, then we have to make a decision, well, which is the more accurate forecast, which makes sense from our, our perspective and based on what we know um, historically as well. Does that happen very often where you go, hey, wait a minute, they're saying this and those guys are saying that? It doesn't happen very often, but it happens, uh, it happens occasionally. Uh, usually they are fairly similar in, uh, in their forecast, but when there is a big difference, we, we need to, we contact our, our forecast providers and we also contact our um, customers as well to see what what the truth is and um, sometimes the truth is uh, can be a little bit fuzzy so again we have to make it make the call at the end of the day and decide what to uh, not what number to go with Joe you ever run into m deliberate misinformation or disinformation being put out there we do you know one thing we we try not to dabble in rumor as a first step right the, we hear a lot of rumors down and and if you put every one of them in there the market is going to be 50% bigger than it is right now. <laughs> so we have to then, like I said, corroborate that with our client base and say, you know, this is, a, this is three, four years away. Does this make any sense to you? And they'll either give it a blessing or non-blessing, but we will try to triangulate like you guys do. Um, we also like to marry our two pieces of data. So we've seen instances where, let's say we have 100,000 vehicles, but then we're hearing about 150,000 engines. And we're going, well, there's a misbalance here or vice versa. So we have to do a global look at all time and say, if we have one piece of information that's more, which is stronger on the powertrain side than the vehicle side, that may drive the vehicle build numbers. Uh, so we have to, con I mean, it's, it, there's no stopping. It is every 30 days we've got to put out a brand new forecast. So my guys never get a break. And uh, we're always continue to refine it. And we're humble enough to say, look, if we can talk to our customers and they say, look, we have information that doesn't support this, we're not going to pay a hard line unless we have to say, yep, but we have this other information that you maybe don't have access to. You know, we'd like to have a discussion. We want to be their advisors, not just their data providers. Adam, you see informa misinformation, disinformation? Uh, I don't, I, not really. I mean, we do see a lot of weird rumors, you know. I mean, there are unfortunately people that believe it's, if it's on the internet, mm -hmm. gosh, it must be true. And so, you know, there's always a couple of examples. Uh, there were used to be rumors of an Audi A7 four-door convertible. And the German media was all over that. And there were folks thinking, yeah, that's got to be coming. And, and so sometimes you have, to, you have to gently shoot it down and explain a couple of reasons why you think it might not work. And, and yeah, you have to kind of cross-reference. Some of it is, is like fact-checking. Some of it's just some common sense and based on your experience and understanding of what our automaker has done and what their capabilities are. So uh, yeah, there is some, we don't like to do the rumor and speculation thing too, but sometimes you have to do scenario development uh, if you don't have enough data to go one direction. But I know as a member of the press, sometimes the press just simply gets things wrong. Not making it up per se, but maybe you didn't hear something right or there was just something that caused confusion. I'm sure you run into that as well. Yeah. Well, and then sometimes you'll get one report that will propagate over like six different media outlets. Mm -hmm. And some people will say, well, I saw it in like five different places. No, no you actually saw one report. It's five different places, right. not five different data points. So, um, yeah, that can be a problem, too. And, Michael, corporations change their mind all the time. They say, hey, we're going to do this. And then sometimes later it's like, nah, I guess maybe we're not going to do that. How do you make sure that you're current and up to date and everything? It's, it's important to maintain constant contact with, uh, with our customers to see if they're, if they're changing their plans. They might, they might say, we have an, this new uh, vehicle and we're gonna build three different body styles. And before you tool up for three different body styles, you, you wanna make sure that that's actually gonna happen. It could, at the end of the day, you may end up with just one body style. Another factor is uh, lo location of production. So they might say, we're gonna build this uh, vehicle in, 
in North America and then decide, well, we'll build it in, uh, in China or in South America to, uh, to save money. And a lot of customers want local um, suppliers, so we have to decide whether well, we're going to supply from North America or supply from South America or from Asia. So it's very important to keep, keep up to date to make sure you make the right decision. I can imagine it's, it's good when you have a client. You can pick up the phone or email them or whatever and say, hey, is this true or not true? What if it's not a client and you need to know that information and know if it's true? If it's not a client, it definitely is more difficult to get the information, and that's where our third-party providers um, help us as well. Um, and then we have, uh, we have uh, contacts in, in all parts of the world so we can um, see what's happening locally see if there's uh, new production going on in, uh, in a certain country. And, um, and constant communication, again, is, is important. Uh, and we have, we have contracts, long-term agreements, um, understandings with, with uh, our customers, even if they're not existing customers. So hopefully we, we can end up making the right decision uh, in, that, in that instance. Joe, I got to believe you love it when companies delay programs, cancel programs, throw in new programs. That's got to make your 30 month uh, deadline all the more exciting. In fact, what we've done is we actually put a weekly report out on Mondays. Every Monday we report it because if you wait 30 days, you might miss yeah. huge opportunities. So every Monday, we email our clients saying, hey, here's all of the production shifts. Here's all the new vehicles. Here's all the cancel vehicles. Here's the labor issues that may affect uh, your, your manufacturing decision. And I'm telling you, sometimes it, we have discussions internal saying, it's going to be 25 pages. Let's cut it off and give it to them. There's just too much to digest, even on a weekly basis. So, and then exponentially, that's just the vehicle side. It's exponentially larger on a powertrain side. Every vehicle could have seven different iterations of a package, whether it's a manual or an automatic or a six versus an eight versus a four. So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic to keep our clients educated on that. And that's where you saw the Multimatic thing of, you know, we might have heard that mid-month, but if it waited, you know, 15 more days, we might not have been the, bat, the first one out of the gates. But it educated people right away of, hey, here's something new that we need to be, uh, be aware of. Now, you got clients. You publish these reports. You mm -hmm. sell them. How... How does that work in that companies are giving you information about what they're going to do and you're going to go tell the world about it? You so know, it's funny. There's sort of a quid pro quo type of relationship. Everyone understands that if you can corroborate something there that we have 50 other clients that are doing the same thing and they'll benefit from it. You know, there was a time where it was interesting where, you know, we would call uh, GM and GM would say, no, I'm not going to tell you anything, but we'll tell you everything about Chrysler and Ford. And then you call Ford, they go, we're not going to tell you anything. We're going to tell you everything we know about Chrysler and GM. So it's, it's, fun. it's an interesting industry. Everyone wants to say, nope, close to the vest. But at the end of the day, there's this common goal of we can't have the opportunity to miss an opportunity. We can't wait. So if we know about it now, sure, I'll corroborate this information. But I'm expecting 100 other good data points out of my relationship with you. So it's not just stealing information from it. It's more of a you know, friendly advisory relationship. Adam, I gotta believe you know all your counterparts at other car companies, and I gotta believe you guys trade information like baseball card trading. No, you know, it's uh, it's more. We'll do like an informal get together at the auto shows uh, when we cross paths. Uh, you know, the Ford and Chrysler guys I know pretty well. Uh, I don't know uh, the folks at the other OEMs on a regular basis. Um, there's not any real, you know, there's uh, strategic competitive intelligence professionals, um, but that organization does not a lot of automotive activities. So uh, as usually at all show, we just cross path informally and chat about what we heard, what we saw, and exchange opinions, but uh, nothing really more formal than that. Mm -hmm. Michael, being on the supplier side, does that all happen amongst competitors to the Eaton Corporation? Do you trade information or is it the wall of, of solitude between you? Uh, we probably don't exchange information as freely as the uh, car companies do. Uh, there is a competitive pressure on suppliers. We're, in many cases, fighting for the same, same contract to get on, on a certain platform. Uh, and there's millions of dollars at stake. But we are, it's in a way, it's a small world. We, uh, some of us have worked for similar companies. Um, we meet at auto shows and various conferences. So we're, we're friendly with, uh, with some of our, our competitors as well. And do you do the same thing that Joe was uh, talking about, where maybe your direct competitors will not give you information, but others will, and you can learn about maybe the company that you do want to learn about that way? Yes, we do get information from other, other sources. Um, so 
car makers can will tell us what uh, what's happening in the industry. We also have, I mean, Eaton is a tier one supplier, so we have tier two suppliers who we work with closely, and they uh, can, can provide us with information as well that can be useful uh, with existing customers or potential future customers. Adam, I know you're especially concentrating on finding out what new cars and trucks and all that are coming out. What about specific technologies? What about other areas? Do you, do you get into anything else? Uh, I mean, I'm personally a bit of a geek, so I kind of look at all the cool toys and bells and whistles. But we have a separate, we have a technology planning group, so they have a technology intelligence. So those are the folks that will cover CES. Um, I've got a guy working for me looking at, at more disruptive type stuff. Uh, you know, looking at Google, you know, I don't think 10 years ago we would have thought of tracking Google as a competitor, but I'm sure all the automa automakers are looking at that now. And what Apple, about Apple? What do you know Apple. about Apple and their supposedly, <laughs> what can you there's, tell us uh, There's here? probably been more speculation written. Uh, I, there, there's probably a bunch of different scenarios we can spin. We know they've hired some folks with some automotive background. Uh, there's been some vans spotted driving around. And, uh, you know, Tim Cook, I don't think, has really said anything publicly. And all the automakers are, are waiting to see where they go. So, um, but uh, we also have folks in our Global Connected Consumer Group, uh, and they'll track kind of the infotainment and, and connectivity side of the business as well. So I think in the old days, our network wasn't as big as it is now, but we've got people that specialize in those particular areas. All right, I want to get back to that in a minute, but Joe, you know anything about the Apple car or what they're uh, doing? I, up boy, to? I, yeah, <laughs> you'll see it Monday <laughs> on my report. <laughs> now, uh, no, we nothing yet, but you know, it's it's the next play. I mean, that's that everyone needs that mobile device. That's the the greatest mobile device there is. You know, your vehicle, and and they're going to play more into it. Whether they're going to buy someone up and do it, who knows? Okay, so same question I asked Adam. I know you're tracking cars and trucks, mm -hmm. that kind of future product. Are there other areas that you get into that you want to track? Now, yeah. Not just technology, uh, what about like plant expansions? What about personnel change? Yeah, so we have to look at the plants because that drives our capacity story, which then goes to a utilization story. Uh, we have to understand where the green fields and the brown fields are going to be. I mean, our biggest story we've been hitting for the last year is the whole, you know, Canada, U.S., Mexico dynamic and greenfield in the south and Everyone's pressuring the north, and we have to completely stay on that because primarily our clients are, those are our clients, they care. It affects their bottom line. So we have to look at the supplier organization. we got to look where innovation's happening. You know, it, it's, it's an interesting dyna dynamic. It's not just what vehicles were built when and where and why, uh, but it's really what's going into that, the economic decisions, the geopolitical decisions that are driving it. But the capacity utilization is a huge issue of saying, boy, can they really put that vehicle there? And if they want to, they're going to have to expand. We're hearing rumor after rumor of expansion. We don't hear any rumor about hundreds of millions of dollars going into that expansion yet. So, so something's not gelling right. So we sort of have our public face that we sell to our clients, and we have our, our go-to hot list of going, here's the 17 things on the back burner that could go live any time. When they do, we'll put them out to our clients. But we like to put the feelers out just in case and start the conversation going. Back to Michael's point earlier about the whole supply chain, right? You know, the tier one's obviously more important, but the tier twos, as you keep going down, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of key knowledge in these core operations that gets expanded up to these system integrators in the tier one. So the tier twos and the tier threes, they act, they, they want to know what's going on because they can add that level of technology innovation that eventually has to be pushed on to the OEM and therefore the consumer. So it's a massive market, lots of people touching this thing. Michael, I gotta believe you really track technology too because whether it's superchargers or transmissions and things like that, I'm, I gotta believe Eaton wants to know what kind of technologies are coming down the pike here. We definitely do, and we know that the, the CAFE standards in the US, 54.5 miles per gallon in 2025, the CO2 standards in Europe, and we, we know that the OEMs need to reach those targets and increase their fuel economy by three or four percent every year going forward. So, and the, the winning suppliers are go going to be the ones who can provide the technology for uh, to get those achieve those goals. So, uh, we we have various products that can help um, improve fuel economy for OEMs, and um, we want to see what which way they're going in terms of boosting, for example. Is, so, downsizing and boosting is is definitely a, a trend that's. Started already. So turbochargers, which Eaton does not make, versus superchargers, which it does. Right, but also in some cases we have compound boosting. So the Volvo XC90, for example, has a supercharger as well as a as well as a turbocharger, and Volkswagen had a couple of models as well. Uh, and we have superchargers that are in, in hybrids from um, uh, Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen, and, and Nissan as well. Um, and then there's things like something as basic as an engine valve, um, hollow engine valves are a little bit lighter than solid valves. 
and they're using GDI engines, and so it's reduced weight, and uh, it falls in with that fuel economy play as well. I gotta believe you're, you're trying to track other technologies that might be a threat to the businesses that Eaton's in. We do that uh, as well. Um, so we, we talk about connected cars and autonomous vehicles. Um, if, if vehicles go all electric, for example, then a lot of our power truck products <laughs> become redundant. Problem. Yeah. So, yes. Redundant's a kind word, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we definitely track the, the demand for connected vehicles, demand for electric vehicles. Um, so far this year, it's been good news for us because gas is cheap, so the demand for electrics and hybrids has, has dropped, and people are buying large, um, large trucks using large engines. So that's, that's good in the short term, but we also look at the long-term trend uh, as well. And then on the, the truck side, I mentioned um, transmissions before. Automated manuals are, um, are fuel efficient. Uh, and then there's also the issue of a driver shortage in the truck industry. So one of the issues there is that today's generation doesn't drive manual transmissions. But if you have an automated transmission, which they can just put in drive, and that does all the work, then you may be able to attract more drivers into the, uh, into the business. Well, the good news is when they go to autonomous trucks, they're still going to need transmissions. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Adam, I, I was fascinated by what you were talking about earlier of the specialization that's starting to take place or has already taken place with uh, competitive uh, intelligence and assessment. Talk a little bit about how that's changed over your time at GM. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been GM centralized at CI back in 1999. And, and then it was, at that time, it was a little like pushing rope uphill as far as dealing with upper management because they were focused on other things. And, and as the industry has changed over the past 15 years, and we've gotten electricity and mass customization and autonomous vehicles, we get much, many more pull signals. And I think our leadership is a lot more externally focused, uh, which is good because there's a lot going on outside there. And as a result, we've been building the network internally. You know, we have regional folks, um, and because the industry has gotten so much more complex, to have a group of like four people looking at manufacturing, powertrain, vehicles, connectivity, uh, light weighting, for example, uh, is kind of impossible. And it, with many, many more players on the market now, too. So it's better to, to bring folks in and say, here's a person that is an expert on light weighting, and let's let them be the CI expert on light weighting. So if we get a question, we understand, you go, yeah, what's Ford doing? And they come back, and then we can put a Ford picture together with Ford light weighting, Ford manufacturing, Ford connectivity, and create a total cohesive look. Real good. Boy, I could talk with you guys for another hour. This has been a fascinating discussion. But I want to thank Adam Bernard from General Motors, Michael Amatoso from Eaton Corporation, and Joe McCabe from Out of Forecast Solutions. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. Great job. Right Very good. <laughs>